Welcome to Share, a podcast production of the Amethyst Recovery Centers. I'm your host, Kabir Singh. At the top of each episode, we like to remind our listeners that addiction is treatable and recovery is possible. If you or a loved one needs help with addiction, call Amethyst today at 855-80-SOBER or visit us online at amethystrecoverycenters.com. Our guest today is Benjamin Lerner, a musician based in Vermont. Lerner is coming up on five years clean and sober, though it took him many attempts to get there. Inspired by his most recent trip to treatment, Lerner recently released Clean, an album that fuses classical music with hip hop vocals and lyrics that draw heavily from his days in active addiction. We're glad to have Benjamin here with us today to discuss his story, his recovery, and the healing power of music. Benjamin, thanks for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. A lot, a lot of times in this podcast, you know, we, we are on a few minutes beforehand and we get to learn <clears throat> about folks that are joining us today in your particular case. Although you are a musician based in Vermont, uh, you, you, you family's down in D.C. Uh, and not far from where I am um, or where we are, um, Amethyst Recovery Center's corporate office space in Owingsville, Baltimore. So not not far. There's there's the BWI Parkway, of course, that that links up the two two places. So. Um, so I'd like to sort of start about the beginning there, you know, before you, there, you have a lot of notoriety in, in music, um, you have family history, you know, with your great grandpa, we'll get into all that. Um, but let's start at the beginning. I mean, so you grew up in DC? Yeah, I was born and raised in Washington, DC. And, uh, yeah, you know, I had a pretty suburban, I'm not going to say white picket fence, but pretty close to a childhood. I came from a family of relative privilege, but even still, I found myself, you know, gravitating towards chemical escapism at an early age. And uh, even before that, I like to say I was an alcoholic and an addict before I took my first drink or my first drug. And what that means is I was always trying to escape myself in any feasible way possible. Like I'm a, I'm a nineties baby. I'm a millennial. So for me, you know, before, you know, it was drinking, it was video games. It was Pokemon cards. And then, you know, that first time I ever knew what alcohol did, because I had had like, you know, a sip or two ceremonially at like a parent's dinner party, like I, when I was a kid, but it wasn't to change consciousness. Mm-hmm. But, you know, that first drink that I actually took, knowing what it did and seeking that effect. I grew up knowing that I was diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome, but separate from any, you know, diagnosis, I was afraid to look people in the eye. I hated myself and I was always uncomfortable in my own skin. And when I drank that disgusting, lukewarm beer that I had stolen from my friend's parents' cabinet, I was like, wow, man, this is the ticket. Because for a second, I didn't have to pretend to be anybody else. I didn't have to deal with this burgeoning beast inside of my mind. And I was just like quiet. But it was a poisonous quiet that took me to incredible lengths. And some of them were actually, you know, up around your way in Baltimore. And I don't want to drug a log too much. Suffice to say that within the scope of like 10 years, It went from that little beer in that basement in that suburban private school house party to a full-blown IV heroin and crack cocaine addiction. And I know the corners of Baltimore very well. I can walk my way from that BWI bus to Fayette and Monroe Street, man. And I'm just grateful to be here today. You know what I mean? Because it can take you there if you're not careful. Yeah, I I can hear that. That's certainly uh, a similar set of circumstances I can relate to. It's it's a common anthem in in recovery, right? Feelings of, of uh, low self-worth, low self-esteem, self-loathing, and the like. And sounds like we're 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 two now grown-up men, but uh, we had most we certainly had everything we needed, most of everything we wanted. However, you just 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 found this particular draw um, to to substances. So you, you highlight the fact that this beer and you start drinking and and, and feeling what oftentimes a lot of us feel in the, in the beginning. Well, how old are you at this point? I was 13 or 14, seventh or eighth grade. Okay. I don't remember the exact time. I just remember the day. I could tell you like the posters that were on the wall, the color of the couch. It was like a watershed moment because I realized I had the ability to offset my problems and put them down the line. I thought I was getting rid of them. I wasn't by using an outside uh, chemical quote unquote solution that ended up being my destruction. So at that particular, I've, I've read a bunch about you but before the podcast you you're also highly musically inclined at a very young age i think i read sort of eight or nine years old what, what, when were you diagnosed with asperger's syndrome when i was three and several were- times later by several other specialists because it impeded my growth and my development in a lot of ways 
And uh, one of the main things about Asperger's syndrome is that there's something called sensory overload. Do you ever see an autistic or an autism spectrum kid putting their hands over their ears and screaming in a mall? I mean, I can't speak for everybody else, but for me, I was functional. So I never got to that point of not being able to tie language to like understanding how the world works, not being able to speak. But I did have that same pattern obsession. And whenever I hear too much or I see too much and it's too overstimulating, I have this kind of reaction where I just want to run and hide. And so a um, music was a great obsession for me because I can channel all my anxiety that comes from that sensory overload into a pattern. And for me, I started writing poetry. I started playing classical piano when I was nine. And, you know, I, I progressed, you know, pretty, pretty well, you know, after my teacher came up with like a Asperger's focused learning system for the numbers, but I ain't going to get into that too much. Suffice to say, when I found hip hop at the age of 14, before I ever integrated the piano, long before, I was just like, wow, this allows me to, you know, integrate my loves for music and words together. And it's a shame that at the same time that I discovered that I was, you know, also spiraling down into addiction. Yeah. And, and, and thank you for, for, for sharing that you know, personal account of, of being diagnosed with Asperger's and, and, and finding channels in music. I think it's an important thing to highlight while this episode, you know, and many episodes of Share Focus around uh, addiction and treatment and recovery and, and things of that sort. You know, I, I was re on, on Memorial Day weekend, I was on a flight down to Florida and immediately in the seat in front of me was, I don't know if it's the right term, you know, highly autistic um, young man. And he was, you know, jostling in, in his seat and making loud noises. And unfortunately, this is like when we were sitting on the tarmac and you had, it wasn't such a full flight uh, and people started to move away. Um, having been educated, I worked for, you know, for, for a while at a severe and persistent mental health services agency. I, I was aware of what was going on. He's not dangerous. He, he's simply going through his process and I, and I sat still. It was, it was a particular moment of me. Uh, I don't think he was aware of it, but I felt like I was supporting the call. His mother actually thanked me. She was, because it was no big deal to me. I wasn't like making faces or like, you know, sitting back. His seat was moving heavy. Like, I mean, yeah. um, it, it, it's really important that that, that folks better understand um, that area of mental health and what's going on there with, with it's such a prevalence of, of folks with autism or on the spectrum and the like. Um, yeah, man, absolutely. Got to reduce that stigma any way you can. And what's interesting is that the same way people, because they might not understand where he's at and how he's just trying to find his comfort in his environment, the same stigma that applies to addiction also applies to mental health, which is why in all my projects, you know, even for people who aren't dual diagnosis, we're all suffering with something. So just spreading awareness, reducing that stigma. That's what it's all about. And you really yeah, did man. that on that plane. And that's awesome. Yeah, man. Thank you. So music runs deep in your family. I, I yeah, didn't man. make mention of it before. I don't know if it's. Yeah, if, you hear about, I'm sure you hear about it all the time, right? Nah, God bless man. America, your great granddad, cool right? It. Yeah, God bless America, white Christmas, blue skies, cheek to cheek. I mean, basically he wrote thousands of songs in his most prolific period that started with like ragtime and like the teens and not not the current teens, the 19 teens. So even before the prohibition, he was, he was popping in the field of ragtime. And uh, yeah, Irving Berlin, you know, born Israel Balin in, in Russia, ran away in 1891 and found the American dream. And, uh, you know, what's interesting is uh, growing up in that family, you know, like I say, we, we, we had it all right. We had, we had some privilege. We had a little money. I like to say we didn't own them all, but we sure as hell shopped there. But, you know, like, the biggest privilege that I had was growing up in a family that valued like intellectual release and like just they didn't care what I did. They just cared that I like channeled my passion and I had wonderful parents. But like growing up with that legacy, I took the pressure that they gave me, which which was considerable. It wasn't that crazy, but I magnified it internally like 10,000 percent. And I started like pressuring myself to live up to that legacy because people would always say, oh, you're Irving Berlin's great grandson. That's so crazy. Like you're musically talented. He was musically talented. And so I wanted to fill those shoes. And even though my parents were nurturing in a lot of ways, there was always this kind of expectation that if you come from a family like that, you have to perform. And even if you don't have like a Hollywood legacy or a famous person in your family, I see that same pressure in families across the country who are in, uh, you know, the rooms of various fellowships, like people who have a sports history in their family, people whose parents are doctors or like, you know, uh, lawyers or anything. There's always a subtle pressure from the outside that you get to kind of continue the family legacy. And in my case, it was music. And I internalized that pressure 
And I began to self-medicate to deal with it, which is why the first song on my album, Performer, the opening line of it is, I'm a performer and the world is a stage. It's not just the music. I take that performer mentality and I bring it to everything. And it's great because I'm able to like, you know, pursue my talents, but it also comes at a detrimental price because my mental health suffers because I always feel like I'm on a stage. Yeah, you, you certainly hit the nail on the head as it pertains to me. And I think a lot of folks and listeners here on, on here on the share podcast, um, you know, measuring up ourselves to, to the outsides of others. I, I know I have no other way to state it. I mean, there's a, there's, there's a lot of stigma in the Indian community. I know self-placed pressure on my, the, all, all these sort of kids that I was forced to be, not forced to be friends, by default were friends, my parents' friends' kids before I made my own kids were my friends, you know, and growing up in an Indian community and like, ah, it would blow my mind, Benjamin, like you, these kids are like third grade, man. They knew they wanted to be doctors. I'm like, what in the actual hell? I'm, I'm like, yeah. I'm trying to light stuff on fire, right? And like, <laughs> and I'm like, how do you know you want to be a doctor in fifth grade? And you're already studying, you know, partially like look, looking at microbiology. Like, yeah, I just, I could never measure up. In, in this cultural sort of, pressure. Mm -hmm, in the cultural pressure, familial pressure, you know, all of it. Um, and sometimes placed on myself and sometimes, uh, taken on by other aspects of the community and or, or parents and siblings and the likes. It's, it's, it's important. Um, so that's incredible. A, a very, very accomplished background in your family. And, you know, you it probably runs in your blood somehow. You just get this stuff from nowhere. Um, you're musically talented. Um, so, you know, that's, that's an important thing to highlight. I'm glad you, you share that with us. And your great granddad is an important part of, of American history. Yeah, I mean, he's uh, he's great American songbook, you know, he's up there with Gershwin and all that. And, you know, I'm, I'm happy to talk about it. And what's interesting is, you know, what he did ragtime, you know, and he crossed over from a background in like jazz and folk music. He was never really classically trained, but he knew his scale. And um, I, I like to think that in a certain way, I'm doing the same thing with hip hop, not on the same scale, not on the same scale of like, you know, relevancy, maybe, but I'm not chasing that, you know. He did the whole Hollywood thing. He did all that. And I grew up with, you know, the Oscar statue and all that and all that. What the what the kids, you know, call today cloud or whatever, you know. But like for me, it was just more about finding something that I was passionate about. And even when I was in the depths of like, you know, the worst days of my narcotic depravity, I always had the outlet of music. And I could always look and see him as an example of the fact that no matter where you come from, you can always chase that dream. And, you know, I've had the chance to work with some incredible people. And one of them that I want to speak on, not to drop names or nothing, but I already crossed that boundary with Irving Berlin. So uh, Mac Miller was actually when I was using, um, before I even started using heroin or opioids or anything, just like, you know, I was an addict, but to marijuana and alcohol, hadn't found my uh, true drug of choice yet. Um, I worked with him when he was 18 before he blew up. We did a song together and then I opened for him. And uh, he was just a wonderful guy, man. You know, yeah. just super humble. And it was really hard for me when I was two years sober to see that he had passed away. And that, that kind of motivated me to get back into music because, uh, you know, there are so many people who are dying from the disease of addiction music. And I think a lot of it comes from the pressure that we were just talking about, man. That like personally, that outside pressure that, you know, musicians magnify, whether it's coming from the industry, your friends, your family, it's deadly, man. And if you're self-medicating with substances, you're sometimes you don't escape it. For sure. I think there's a, a lot of, uh, sentiment that that in, in musicians uh, while i'm not one uh, i've spent time you know, a lot of time reading about things and, and folks like yourself that are in the in the, in the industry you, that they may lose their creativity if they get if they get clean or if they get sober you you, you just actually highlighted a detail you know mac miller died uh, passed away from from um using it when you're two years clean Right. And so and then it inspired you to get back into music. So if I, just to back step for a second, you, you get things get out of hand. Yeah. So look, what, what happens in, in that little encapsulated part of the, the, your 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 illustrious story here before I got sober? Yeah, like I mean, like so you so okay. you get sober. I don't know if you know, did you end up in treatment? Yeah. And there's a period Spark of time notes where version of it. Spark mm -hmm. notes version of it. I'm a alcohol classic entitled suburban brat, alcoholic pothead, stealing my parents' car, money, you name it, to go around. I dropped out of college to like finance some like half-baked weed rap album. And then I got crashed my car, got a multiple accident DUI. Thankfully, no one was hurt but me, but it put a dent in my plans. And uh, so to manage consequences, I did what we call a geographic in my sobriety fellowship. 
I moved out to California to reconnect with my dad. My parents were divorced at the time I went out there, but the one line at the time I said I wouldn't cross was pharmaceuticals, but had all my wisdom teeth taken out. They were all impacted. I got dry socket. This was before the apex of the opioid epidemic in 2012. They gave me 100 Percocets, no questions asked. And because I couldn't turn to my drug of marijuana for like my relief from my, you know, uh, terribly overcrowded and uh, over anxious mind, I turned to the Percocets. And within six months, I was snorting Oxy 30s. Within a year, I was snorting heroin. I went to treatment for the first time because I couldn't lie to my family, but I didn't go to get sober. I just did it to manage consequences again. I got out convinced him I was okay, went back to the same environment where I was using in the open air drug markets in California, escalated to smoking 30s, using IV heroin, using crack. And I was in and out of treatment centers on uh, buprenorphine therapy for uh, two and a half years. And then at the end of it, man, like, you know, I'll be honest, like I was, I've crossed every line except selling my body and, you know, robbing people at gunpoint. I was stealing from my friends, stealing hundreds of thousands of dollars from my family. And I still thought I was doing okay. And I still thought I was justified in using, I actually thought I was doing people a favor because I thought you don't want to see me when I'm dope sick. You don't want to see me when I will do anything that I can to not be sick, to not have a seizure, to not throw up. And I didn't think recovery was possible. I had been to treatment, but I was like, it's possible for them, but they're not as smart as me. They're not as crazy as me. And it really took to the point where the drugs no longer gave me the spiritual relief that I sought, that I was ready to do something different. And that's when I came to treatment on June 13th of 2016. And that's where I started this go around, man. And I was humble. I was ready. I've been beat up long enough that I was ready to try something different. And, so multiple, uh, multiple visits to treatment, it, it yeah. sounds like, right? You didn't get it on the first time. It's important. No. Benjamin, I'm glad you're sharing that with us because it's important that the listener, a lot of folks who listen to the, the, these share podcasts either have uh, family that are in the throes of addiction. Maybe they're in recovery now. Maybe they're getting their toe. Maybe they're looking for treatment. I, I don't, you know, we don't always know, but they're listening. And so you didn't get it overnight. M multiple yeah. tries. Yeah, I think like, you know, two inpatients, this last one where I've been sober for several years now and clean several years now was in 2016. And that was my second inpatient. But in between my first inpatient where I just went to manage consequences and the one where I was actually kind of ready, like, you know, I did seven or eight outpatient courses and uh, I was just doing it to get my family off my back and, uh, you know, not be sick and get off the street. Um, but what do, you think, what do you think happened this last time in 2016? You were just, you're just beaten up. Yeah, man. I mean, I was in, if you, if you really want to know, I was in this, uh, you know, seedy hotel room in, in New York. I'd stolen like half a stack from my family. I had whipped their car up without their knowledge. And, you know, I was in there with my friend and he's actually sober and clean now too. It's a beautiful thing. He's several years sober and clean. And that, and we talk, you know, on the regular and he's uh, he's a good guy, but um, we're both heroin addicts, low bottom IV heroin addicts. We're in this uh, hotel and I had all the drugs I wanted. I wasn't dope sick. I wasn't like, you know, running from the law. There were no real consequences other than my addiction in itself. But, you know, when I loaded up and, you know, did my thing, it, it got me chemically high, but it didn't give me that same like, you know, false, blissful, destructive euphoria I got from that initial beer. I got from that initial Percocet and I got from the first time I shot dope. It was gone. Um, I think there's a quote in one sobriety fellowship text, which is like I had my exhausted my right to like chemical escapism or something like that. And I knew I had three options. I could try to OD. I could keep using and hope that it came back and just chase the dragon for the rest of my life, or I could try something different. Uh, so I got scared for the first time, not from the consequence, sorry, consequences. DUI couldn't do nothing to me. You know, waking up dope sick, stealing from my fam couldn't do nothing. But when I could not feel the way I wanted to, I was like really scared because for the first time in my life, I had to confront the underlying issues. And that's when I was ready to seek treatment. Yeah, that's, a, that's an important uh, piece of, of my story as well and I always you know focus on the end but much like yourself and I, I heard you say at the beginning I, I, I picked that sentiment up from you uh, right from that first drink of that warm beer that you all took from whoever's parents back there in DC uh, when you're youngsters um, to everything you, you have now I know for a fact if like if I'm real with myself I know for a fact that even the times where I might have considered it fun I trashed every single moment that I was ever in. It was always like, okay, that you know, maybe that the, the warm beer's about to run out, man. We only we only got four of these things. We're like, you know, eventually, when I got a little older and I and I got into that, you know, and I'm on the other side of the ropes at the nightclub, right, the special side of the the ropes, and I've got you know, I've got Boo with me. Like, oh, who's she talking to? When's when's the coke dealer getting here? When's it? 
I rock. I trashed every moment I ever even even that, I I consider those times in nightclubs fun, uh, until I really got into recovery and did a process of self discovery and looked at those situations and unpacked them because I wasn't even present in those days. It was always like, man, we're gonna run out. What's gonna happen now? Where's the after party? Was it was was the party after the after party? I mean, like, and and, um, and I appreciate that. I'm picking that up about you. Is that um, you're true to yourself today? And, yeah, and you've got a, gut, a good lens into into who you are uh, in the process of recovery. And that sort of leads me to what I'm, I'm going to talk about next is um, you talked about I mean, that period of time where Mac Miller's lost um, to the world and, and he loses his life to, to this disease. And you uh, have a spark to get back into music. So, so you, you've lost uh, during all this previously what you just talked about a moment or two ago. You're not doing music anymore. I mean, you're, you're like using, you're in the throes. Well, what was interesting is, you know, I never stopped making music, but music wasn't my primary drive anymore. Like I was recording like SoundCloud tracks when I was out in San Francisco. And I had a group of friends that even though I was a junkie, there was one line I wouldn't cross. I wouldn't steal from them. I did one time when I was super sick, but I hated myself for it because it was my haven. It was the one place where I could be safe and escape from my horrible life. And I made tracks when I was using, and I wrote tracks early on in recovery, but I wasn't like, chasing it full force because I made the best decision I ever made in my early recovery. When I first went to rehab, you know, I was with a clique of musicians still loosely affiliated up in New York who ended up signing like a small indie deal with like a Sony affiliate. And um, I don't know the details of it. I'm not going to disclose what I don't know. But like, they said, hey, skinny, which was my rap name at the time before I used my, you know, natural born name. Uh, skinny, if you sober up and get on Suboxone, like come back up to New York where we're at, like you can part, join part of this, you can become part of this. And I, that was one of the reasons I got sober. I was like, yeah, man, I'll go to rehab. I'll do what it takes. But when I got out, I realized, nah, I'm more interested in staying sober and using my power to reclaim my life than I am my music. And um, the reason is that all I rapped about for years as an addict was addiction and was using. And that's all I knew. And uh, if I just got out of my addiction and had no stories from my life, no struggle, because hip hop comes from struggle, man. I mean, at least real hip hop. I mean, you got the like Dionysian, like, you know, hedonistic splendor rap. It's no cool, too. But like the real hip hop, whether it's like new street trap stuff or old school hip hop comes from struggle. And I wanted to go through that struggle. I wanted to get a job. I wanted to live in a sober house. I wanted to experience life sober, experience the letdown, experience all that, because I knew that it would make my music better and that it did. And, you know, two years in when Mac died, I had my life back, man. And like I was still writing raps for like a passion. But my real passion was, you know, going to my fellowship, you know, working my program, you know, getting high off of life. And I know that's corny and like a maxim that's overused. But honestly, man, there is a real endorphin rush that I got chemical from working out, from eating right, from going to my job, from like having, you know, steady relationships instead of just drug based relationships with, you know, people, my significant others. And, you know, when Mac died, I had been working on my first piano raps because in my the sides of my musicality that I didn't think was possible, you know. And so when Mac died, I was just like, you know what, I got to carry the torch for people who ain't here because Lil Peep had died the year before, huge fan of his, everybody was just dropping like flies, Gucci man had gotten sober, and I grew up smoking weed listening to Gucci man, I was like, if he's <laughs> sober and he's making sober music, come on, I got to do something. And so when Mac died, I was like, yeah, man, I got to, I got to do something. I got to use my platform to talk about recovery. And I was ready. And I had taken the time to get my life back in order. And I was like, I got something to rap about now. And I would tell anybody who's like, you know, a creative in early recovery, don't be afraid to learn from your life experiences and take a break to get your life back because you will come back from that time in recovery with new stuff to write songs about. If you're a painter, new stuff to paint about whatever your creative medium or your passion is, you will come back recharged and you'll come back better than ever. That's my experience, at least. I, I appreciate you sharing that. There is a certain um, undisputed, undoubted therapeutic value of, of music. I, I, when, I, when I was in treatment here in, in Maryland, I, I was in a treatment center in Montgomery County. Um, one, of, one of the guys in there, he, he had played music uh, in the DC Go-Go's with Chuck Brown and stuff. Uh, he actually is um, Logic's biological father, the, the rapper wow. Logic. He, I was in treatment with him. And um, he would often uh, break out in, into um, these music sessions and stuff when we'd have break time and it was there was a lot of 
it was some of the the first moments in that in that 28 day program where I, I would feel joy and, and laughter and was starting to have um, some semblance of normalcy or like it being uh, revived, I guess, if you will, to, to, to my true self. And, and it takes time. And, and, I, and, I, and I'm picking that up from what you're saying. It doesn't happen overnight. In your particular case, you ended up in, in recovery residence, some call them sober homes, whatever we want to call them, you know, a place of uh, clean and sober living where, where, we, where we, get, we, we relearn a lot of things we forgot or may not even have known. Um, it's incredible that you realize that because you probably didn't have to do that. I mean, there, there, there were maybe other choices, I, I guess I should say. Yeah, I mean, there's always another choice, man. And uh, I guess, you know, when I tell people this, they kind of look at me with, you know, like a kind of cockeyed stare. They're like, what do you mean? But when you're when you're using dope and crack or whatever your drug of choice, it could be alcohol, whatever. Um, and you're using it to the level that you're just complete oblivion all day, like oblivion is your baseline. It just becomes kind of this white noise where you're not even really getting high anymore. It's just it's just your normal state, even if it's like a chemical infusion all the time. And so when I got sober, I was like, this is different. And I realized that like the first time I had that beer, that feeling of, wow, this is different and I'm messed with this. That's the same feeling I got when I had my first like couple months sober. I was like, this is different. And in a way, it was like, I don't want to say a high, but the clarity that I got from that was a similarly different and life changing experience than the clarity I thought that I got from that beer. And I've been getting high for so long that sober was new to me. And I wanted to chase that in the same way that I used to chase that dope and like chase that bottle. And I wanted to chase music, too, you know, and I could have done something different. You know, I could have gone back out. I could have gone up and like, you know, hung out with my friends in New York and they're still doing their thing and salute to them. Like, you know, different strokes for different folks. But I knew that, like, you know, I had to get on a path where I could refine my craft, sharpen my sword and have some experiences that I'd never had before, man, because I've been working my whole life to not work. And people say addicts aren't hard workers. I don't think that's true at all. If you want to like get high every day, manipulate, calm people, do that. That's hard work, man. I worked harder in my addiction than I do any day sober. I just don't lie anymore. I don't lie to myself. I try not to lie to other people, even if it's like white lies, you know, like maybe like, you know, oh, you, do you look good in that dress? Yeah, maybe, maybe I'll do that. But like, you know, that's just trying to be compassionate. But like the point is, if you put one foot in front of the other in recovery, you might be surprised about how it leads you back to your passions at the right time. And I knew that if I stayed in that sober house, my craft would be better. I don't know how I knew it. I was just like, I've been doing the same thing for like 10 years. That's played out. I'm not trying to rap about that anymore. I'm not trying to live that way anymore. It's boring, man. I got bored of it. I want to try something new. The authenticity that that comes about, certainly as I've heard it described by you, as it's been my experience for myself, it is is on unparalleled and and it the important thing I, I i know for myself for my own experience is you know it doesn't happen overnight it, 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 it can happen you know it's for, first hopefully the obsession and compulsion to destroy ourselves with drugs and alcohol is lifted and then we you know perhaps are are able to to, to better become our true authentic and original selves or recreate ourselves i should say and I'm, and I'm hearing that in your story and it's been my experience too especially as one one of the things of, of just finding my way in this industry and, and working to uh, help others, especially in in, in the treatment uh, industry, um, it it's it's been incredible. It's 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 indescribable. If anyone had had asked me, even you know, I I just acknowledge ten years. You're about to you're about to have five. Um, I think if I think if anyone asked you five years ago what your life would look like in five years, you would you would the description you would have given would have been far short. I know me five years ago, even with five years clean, would have sold myself short. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm encourage others to stay around. Yeah, man. I mean, what's crazy about this, and I don't mean to self plug too much, was you know even after that Mac moment, like you know I thought that like you know I wasn't going to be able to rap in the same way when I got you know clean and sober, and I'm not. It's different. I mean, I'm not going to lie that in a, that crazy inhibition free freestyle zone, it, it's gone. But what's it's been replaced with? is clarity and the ability to really articulate my thoughts and write stories and tell clear and cohesive stories not just with the words but with the music and what's really also helped me in my story i gotta be real um i've had a lot of help along the way in my recovery my my family you know the treatment center the outpatient center that allowed me to come back and work as a like treatment counselor wow but you know when i was two and a half years in 
Um, I met this dude, Dr. Joshua Sherman, who's my current mentor, boss, you know, friend that I'm working with. You know, he built this beautiful studio up here in Vermont. And I've been coming up here to Vermont since I was a little kid, right? I never thought I'd be back up here. When I was using, my dad said he was going to have to sell the house. But through the, you know, the joy of recovery and the rebirth of recovery, he gave that house to me and it led me to, led to me coming up here and meeting someone who's actually a doctor with a history of treating pavement, uh, patients with pain management, addiction uh, problems although he was just a general hospitalist, but he dealt with people who were in addiction. And in Vermont, as in Baltimore, there's a huge addiction problem there. And we've been able to team up over the past couple of years and use our experiences as a producer, artist, doctor, patient to start this you know, national recovery awareness campaign. And we've taken it to you know, the halls of power, man. We've taken it to the Aspen Institute, you know, former Congress people, senators, like people who own like huge HMOs and like you know, Harvard Medical School people. And they're asking me like, asking a you know where i've been but they're asking me because i'm sober like how can i how can i help people like you and that's the incredible thing about it man it's not it's not the fact that you know like i got a certain blog to post my album or funk master flex to post my video or like you know get a certain collaboration a certain like news story or like that i got a radio show on a thing up here in vermont a column like a house a car a girlfriend that's all great here's what's better than all of that the same people who used to look at me with concern, treatment center workers, doctors, my family, my friends, now come to me. I really got, I just got to be real for hope. They're like, how did you do it? My brother is suffering. My mom is suffering. My daughter is suffering. How did you do it? How can I help people? So being able to help people with what I'm doing, as opposed to like drag them down, man, can't put a price on that. There is no way to put a price on that. I agree. And I've had similar, um, experiences happen to me I've, I've now where I perhaps might have been a burden I'm now a resource it, it's a, it's an incredible uh you know w without gloating or or, or self-promoting uh it's a wonderful place to be and, and to be able to be a, a resource truly with, without any strings attached for those um who are seeking help is I'd say beyond anything like you described well, way better than you know any 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 material stuff or you know her or that or this um and being a resource to anyone who's struggling out there is, is a tremendous experience and i applaud you for it um you, you talked about not not self-promoting so i'm gonna do it for you your album clean yeah i'm, I'm sure you've gotten feedback on it um it, it's a success in and of itself you, you, i'm sure there's a lot of feedback coming on it and what, what, what are you what are you hearing about it um how, how do we find it probably probably wherever we get music but you, i'll let you talk about it well, Clean is available. It's uh, my album, but I couldn't have done it without the help of my producer and friend, Dr. Joshua Sherman, and his Broadway background kind of coalesced with my Irving Berlin thing to like make this really, you know, cool album that, like you said, is uh, both hip hop based and classical piano based. And it was really dope to like bring together, you know, the vision. It tells the story of my addiction and recovery. It's called Clean. It's available on Spotify, you know, Deezer, I think uh, Tidal, all that, all the streaming services. And I got some videos online, too. I got a video for a track called Dan and Dave, which is this kind of like epic storytelling track that tells the story of, uh, you know, me, but really every other addict who follows a similar trajectory to me and, you know, someone else who faces different consequences than I did. But the truth is, it's everywhere in the country. There's a video called Liquid Fentanyl, uh, where I talk about, you know, how like, you know, using is dope but like being sober and like doing what i'm doing now is even doper than that to the point that it's like as potent as liquid fentanyl to be sober that's the ultimate irony and um you know there's a bunch of other tracks on there one's called scars and it talks about getting over uh you know seeing your weaknesses as your strengths and for me it's literally like track mark scars on my arms but for a lot of people you know could be self-harm could be track mark scars but there's a lot of metaphorical scars and deep scars that no one sees under the surface. And I feel like whether you have a history of addiction, trauma, anything like that, everybody's dealing with something. Suffice it to say that, you know, it's really resonated with a lot of people. I mean, like I said, it was incredible because uh, Funk Master Flex, you know, this old school hip hop DJ in New York, he's yeah. he's one of my idols, man. And he has like, I love freestyle and I love freestyle rap. And my dream was to always get on that show. And I knew that when I was making this album that like, you know, playing piano, that's not what they do over there. But like, he had this contest where it was just like, you know, submit like an independent music video. Like, you know, uh, this was before COVID. He's like, come down, like freestyle and all that. And I was just posting it because I wanted people to see the video, but it won. And it, and it got, and it got there. And like, you know, the, the reason I'm talking about that in terms of like, to sum it up is 
it's a perfect metaphor for recovery. Yeah. Like, you know, I got to like, you know, be on flex page and like all that. Oh yeah. That's cool. That cloud, all that. But that's not the point. The point is that when I told my friends like at, at Cypher League, the clique I used to rock with in New York, that I couldn't come up because I was working on my recovery. I thought I was giving up my chance to be part of the hip hop community for my recovery. But what actually happened is that through a circuitous set of coincidences that wouldn't have happened at all if I didn't get sober, didn't stay sober, didn't work up from a bus boy, you know, to a, to like, you know, a server to like working at a treatment center, doing my, getting my life right, doing all that. I would have never been able to get there because somewhere along the line, even if I had been in New York, closer to that scene, closer to that hip hop community, if I wasn't working on my recovery, I would have relapsed and none of this would have been possible. And uh, that's why I got to say to people, Clean tells the story of redemption. It tells the story of my, you know, my musical journey, my life journey. But really, it tells the story of anybody who's been through rock bottom in any sense and has to climb out of the other side and figure out how to live their life again. And one of the things that the pandemic has taught me not to get too far from the from the topic, but I have to talk about this because so many addicts have been, you know, suffering because of the isolation and, you know, all this is, um, you know, I finally think that people understand what it's like to feel isolated at home, not trusting anyone to go outside, because when I was three and a half years clean and sober, I had just put my album out, the pandemic hit. And I was used to like looking people in the eye for the first time I got Asperger's, man, I want to hide. But because I was three years sober, I'd finally gotten to a place where I didn't want to wear a metaphorical mask. And they told me, wear a mask, stay inside, don't go anywhere, meetings are canceled. Wow. And I was just like, what do I do now? But through music, through the program, and through incredible like Zoom podcasts like this, recovery did happen. And that's what the albums really enabled me to do is connect with people. Because even though it got released right before the pandemic, I didn't get to perform the way I wanted, didn't get to like promote it the way I wanted. The ultimate prize of it was that I was able to convert it into something far greater, which is a way to connect with people. And in times like these, that's more important than ever before. Well, thank you for sharing that with us. We're, we're looking forward to, to hearing the album as well and, and, and hopefully seeing some, some performances wherever we can catch you at. Um, and, you know, hopefully you'll be you join us again here, Benjamin. It has been a really exciting episode of Share, and um, we hope that you come back here in the future and join us again for some some more stuff. Yeah, man, I'm down. That sounds really fun. Thanks. Well, there you have it, folks. Sometimes creativity can only bloom once we put down the drugs and alcohol, and we hope that Benjamin has shown you that getting clean is only the beginning of your artistic endeavors. If you or a loved one needs help with addiction, call Amethyst today at 855-80-SOBER or visit us online at amethystrecoverycenters.com. You can find all episodes of SHARE at amethystrecoverycenters.com backslash SHARE or download episodes wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for joining us for another episode of SHARE. I'm Kabir Singh, and we'll see you next time.